Praise the Lord. You know, they got me a nice seat. I'm just feeling led to stand uh, tonight for a little bit. I'm just going to stand up. And let's begin in Numbers chapter 30, shall we? Ah, I got to start all over now. Numbers, it's right after Genesis, right before Revelation. In case you're not sure where Numbers is. Uh, How many love the Word? You been in the Word this week? Great stuff. Well, let's find out. This week's parasha, uh, Torah portion is matat, or matot, uh, excuse me, and um, it's it's right on uh, on the heels of Pincus. How many have any, any children named Pincus out there? One? Okay. I'll pray for you. Okay. Pray for him, I'm sure. No, but uh, Pincus, Phineas, uh, more, more popularly known as the guy who speared the Midianite woman or the Moabite woman and one of his brethren from the tribe of what? Remember? I think it was Reuben. Okay. And so we're going to pick up that story here in just a few minutes, but before we do, we're going to go through God sandwiches this this section with the beginning of Numbers chapter 30 with all about oaths and promises. So let's talk about that for just a minute and discover what God says about oaths and promises because if we don't understand how our lips operate and what comes out of our mouth and the significance and gravity of it, then we are able to have sloppiness in our mouths, sloppiness in our words, and, and our oaths uh, will tend to not mean anything. But before we do anything, let's open up in prayer. Father, thank you so much for just your ruach, your presence here tonight. Lord, your very face, your panim, we ask that it would glow tonight, that your word would become alive inside of us, that it would mean something, Lord, that you would change us from the inside out. Lord, that not anything that I say that comes from me will be heard, but everything that comes from your frequency, the sound of your throne room, and your lips, Lord, I pray you go deep inside the heart channels of your people, and I pray you would unblock arteries right now, Father, in the physical and the spiritual realm. You would heal people, Lord, according to your word. We thank you, God, for bringing us into a rhythm, a rhythmic heartbeat, Lord, in your cycles of life. In Yeshua's name, everyone said. All right, let's begin. In Numbers chapter 30, verse 1, says, The law concerning vows. Then Moshe spoke to the children of Israel, the heads of the tribe, excuse me, concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which Yahweh has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do all according, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house, in her youth, here's what happens. And her father hears her vow in the agreement by which she has bound herself, and the father holds his peace, then the vow shall stand, and every agreement which she has bound herself shall stand. Now, I know that, listen, we get in, in the middle of life, and uh, there's a lot of questions that come to leadership and uh, those in leadership here at PFT about how do we handle, like, what about my dad, you know, and, and where's the, the spiritual authority and the structures? Well, right off the bat here, in a very subtle way, God is telling us that there is, a, there is a structure of authority that he works through. How do we know that? Because Moses is not speaking to all the children of Israel. Who is he speaking to? The heads of the tribes. And so he is giving instruction to the heads of the tribes and what is the understanding there? That they are going to give instructions down to the, the leaders of the thousands, the hundreds, the fifties, and the tens. There is a structural leadership Uh, This is a leadership conference that Moses is having right now, and he's expecting this to trickle all the way down. Now, in reality, this is really important that we understand the Torah on these things because God, whether ladies, whether you like it or not, God is a patriarchal system uh, government. He created a patriarchal system government so that he could properly, properly take his character and embed it into the hearts and DNA of men, and then men, by, uh, by default, would serve to such a capacity that people would actually want to follow them. That's really the true path of leadership. 
Leadership is not saying, I'm the leader, follow me, submit. Husbands, for just a second, give you a clue, especially those of you that are new husbands in here. If you have to tell your wife to submit, probably not going to work out so well. I'm not going to ask all of you husbands uh, that have been married uh, as long and longer than I have. You know, I'm 18 years here in a few months of being married, and I can assure you I only made that mistake once. That's, and that's mostly, uh, most men I think would have made that mistake where they quote that scripture. That is not, in the middle of an argument, is not the time to quote that scripture of wives, submit to your husbands, all right? Because if they know scripture, what are they going to say? Oh yeah, well I would, if you love me like Christ loved the church. And then he just puts his tail between his legs and turns around and walks home, right? Because he's done already been kicked out of the car on the way home, so it's all right. But God says this. He says that he desires his people to understand his word. So let's keep going because he's going to give us some instruction here. And the father hears the vow in the agreement, verse 4, which she bound herself. And the father holds his peace. Everything stands. But at the moment that the father hears the vow of his daughter, that's living under his patriarchal spiritual authority, and she makes a vow or a contract or agreement in ancient Israel that he disagrees with, he has the right to immediately annul it. Now, here's the, 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 there's, a, there's a kicker here. Now, today, can you imagine how much our young people, that's protection, by the way. That's protection. That is not a, an overarching uh, of, of, of a power and authority or an overreach. It's he says, I have wisdom. You have not only been here for 17 years. I'm going to annul this contract. Can you imagine if, if, if a son who's 18 years old living at home decides, you know what? I'm just going to go out and buy a brand new car. And he buys a brand new 2014 Camaro and he drives it home. He says, Dad, check it out. And Dad says, That's awesome. Sit in the passenger, son, because we're going back to the car dealership. I'm annulling this contract for your benefit. We would have a much more balanced society in families and homes if there was a patriarchal balance of respect. You see, it's not just going one way of husbands and fathers that are, are reaching their hands and making sure that their family is okay. There's a mutual respect of submission that children and wives say, I recognize the wisdom and authority that God has given you. I place this on your lap. Matter of fact, a lot of wives make a huge, huge mistake of taking this role. Huge mistake. Because maybe their husbands don't have the wisdom that they think that they should have. Or maybe they're not as spiritual as the wife from the perspective of, of the wife. So what happens is that those particular wives tend to take the reins because the husband is not taking the reins. And I want to ask the question, where in Scripture do you have that right? If the cart sits on the side of the road your whole life, that's not your problem. You are not biblically allowed to take the reins and say, husband, I'm sorry, you're not moving. Get out of the cab, sit in the back seat, I'm driving. But this is how wives tend to come towards their husbands when the husbands aren't doing their job. And you know what that's going to breed? We're really good at just sitting in the back seat saying, that's fine. As long as I got remote, my remote control, I'll let, you, I'll let you drive. I'll watch TV all the way there. It paralyzes us men. If you want to scare men faster than you can blink an eye, here's what you should say. We've got some decisions to make, husband. This is what I'm going to put on your plate because I know that God has put you in a, in a, in a, in a spiritual position of authority in our home. And I submit to you that this is what I believe that the Holy Spirit is doing. But I'm going to put this on your lap. And whatever decision and choice that you make, as long as it doesn't go against the Word of God, I totally trust that you will make the right decision. Now, husbands, if you got that speech from your wife, you know that that is not a speech we want to hear. Because we would much rather just let them make the decision. But when they put it in our lap with that, what are they doing? They're honoring us in our position that God has given us and putting us in a corner where we actually have to do something. Go figure. We have to make a decision. We have to actually make the right decision because our wives are trusting us to make that right decision. 
How can a husband ever grow to a place where he's even capable of making a decision if, we, if you make all the decisions for us? And just let us know, by the way, I got reservation 7 p.m. on Tuesday for us for dinner. Okay, that's great. If you live our lives as if you are mothers, unfortunately, the husbands that I deal with will be sons. And then what you'll do is you'll complain to God and say, I, I don't want to be his mother. But you act just like it. You don't want to be his mother, but everything you do tells him that uh, he's under your authority. That is a Jezebel spirit, regardless of how holy that you want to call yourself. Because Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel, controls Ahab, controls him. And so this system is really critical because nowhere to be found here is the wife in making these annulments. God says, I don't care. Matter of fact, there's not even a, and I hope this doesn't hurt your feelings here. If it does, it's not my problem. I'm just reading from the scriptures. Don't get mad at me and don't send me emails. Because I love you enough to tell you the truth. But there's nowhere here that gives a dictation or a, a characterization that says, for holy men, when their wives or their daughters do something that's out of alignment, this is, the decision, this is what you need to do. It never says that. It says men of Israel, if this happens, you have the right to annul these things. There's no description of holiness or godliness. This is the, 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 the strength of the, or excuse me, the growth pattern that God created for holiness and godliness. These are the rules. Either we play by God rules or we don't play by God rules. I've been asked many times, what, what happens if a, you know, a 20-year-old daughter moves out of a house and, and she decides to, to do this, and then the, the father wants to, you know, he doesn't have the right. He gives up. If, if a husband, or excuse me, if a father has a, has a relationship with his daughter where it, for whatever reason the daughter leaves the home, there's no spiritual authority going on there anymore. There's no biblical precedent for saying, well, daughter, you have no right to do this, do this, marry this person. Marry. No. He comes into a role of spiritual advisement, an advisor. He takes a new role. It doesn't matter how old you are sitting in this room and the sound of my voice, some of you still have in-laws that still try to control the decisions that you are making because they're looking at you because they're always going to be 20 years older. They're still looking at you in a son or daughter. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm not going to have you raise hands because I know that your mother-in-law might be watching tonight and we don't want to get any more issues going on. But the truth of the matter is, is God says that there is order. Let's move forward. But if her father overrules her on the day that he hears it, then none of her vows or her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand, and the Lord will release her because her father overruled her. If indeed she takes a husband while bound by her vows or by rash utterance from her lips by which she bound herself, and her husband hears it and makes no response to her on that day that he hears it, then her vow shall stand, and her agreements by which she's bound herself shall stand. But if her husband overrules her on the day that he hears it, he shall make a void, he shall make void her vow which he took, she took, and what she uttered with her lips, by which she bound herself, and the Lord will release her. Also, any vow of a widow or divorced woman by which she has bound herself shall stand against her, period. If she vowed in her husband's house or bound herself by an agreement with an oath and her husband heard it and made no response, then it stands, okay? Jump down to verse 13. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict her soul, her husband may confirm it or her husband may make it void. Now, if her husband makes no response whatsoever to her from that day, he confirms her vows, then everything stands. Verse 15, but if he does make them void as he heard them, then he shall bear her guilt. And I want to stop right there for just a moment because this is giving us a dynamic here because some of you are thinking, okay, in modern day uh, situation, what happens if you know, my wife creates a, a contract or even back then, it didn't matter. What's happening here is one of the most beautiful forms of teaching us spiritual connection in authority between a husband and a wife. Because today, the reason why we have such a problem with a patriarch in, in some circles, patriarchal authority, is not because the word of God is messed up or because he made a decision that was wrong. It's because it's been abused. The patriarchal system has been abused. 
So we are running into generations of, of, of women now that are taking the lead because their husbands or their grandfathers misused and abused the spiritual authority that God gave. But what you see right here is amazing in one little phrase that you have to really dig into to see the depth of it. It says in verse 15, if he does make them void, he bears her guilt. You, do you see the relationship going on? He's not just saying, bam, I'm nullifying this contract, you're on your own. He understands that when he extends the spiritual authority that God gave him, he's responsible He's taking responsibility for those decisions that he's about to make, and it could hurt him. Matter of fact, in, in the Targums of Jonathan, the Aramaic version of the Torah, it says that he takes on her sin. Now, what this is, is a beautiful picture of Messiah and the bride. That what does Yeshua do? Yeshua does what? He takes on the guilt of his bride for making terrible decisions. Because that's exactly what we are. We are a bride that the Bible says whored among the nations, prostituted herself, and has sinned before the judgment seat of God and deserves death until God jumps in and says, I can't say, well, in the, in the moment of her vow, he can't do anything about it. He cannot annul that, that vow. He chooses to let it stand. This is ironic because in the, in, the, in the physical realm, he gives husbands the right to annul those things immediately when he sees something that's out of balance so that future generations and the current generations do not get hurt by that decision. But the heavenly father and the husband of Israel decides to say, no, I'm going to let her have her way. I'm going to allow her to walk in the direction that she's walking. And in doing so, out of love, he is allowing her to learn a lesson. But then there comes a time when he says, enough is enough. I am utilizing my patriarchal authority and I am going to take her sin on me. I'm going to nullify what the enemy has deceived my bride into making a terrible decision. That is the relationship that a husband is supposed to have with his wife. It's a relationship of love. It's a relationship of, honey, I understand that this is the direction that, that, um, you, know, that, that you made this, this decision in haste. But I've got your back. I'm going to nullify this. I'm going to call this gentleman. I'm going to explain to him that, uh, that this happened and, and I didn't know about it. And I'm, I'm going to appeal to annul this contract or to annul this situation. And it doesn't even have to be a contract. It can be almost anything. Husbands, your job is to put a hedge of protection around your wife. All right, so then we go from here into a, a complete change of gears. So it seems. As we're now, we're going to move into chapter 31. It talks about the vengeance on the Midianites. Because how many remember what happened with, with uh, a couple of weeks ago? We had, the, we had Balaam and, and Balak, right? Balaam's donkey. And King Balak and the Israelites were moving by the millions. And all of a sudden, Balak gets, King Balak gets really um, nervous. So he calls Balaam of Beor and, and says, hey, I want you to come out here and I want you to put a curse on the Israelites because there's so many of them, they'll just swallow us up. They'll eat everything. They're, they have tens of hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of thousands of cows. They, I don't want to move in through here. Put a curse on them. And you guys know how that whole story ended. And then you have Pincus, right? Pincus, who also gets involved with, with the whole Moabite thing, and, and he kills you know, the, the Moabite uh, a, a woman and, uh, and, and, uh, and the Israelite man that was with her, and, and God says, I'm going to give you a, 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 a contract of peace for the rest of your life because of your zeal, the zeal of Phineas. Well, all those stories are about to culminate together here as we move to the vengeance on the Midianites because God is going to have vengeance, because vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So let's just read in verse 1. It says, And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel. Afterwards you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people. How's that for, by the way, a good pep talk? You know, have vengeance on the Midianites, then I'm going to kill you. And you're, you're going you're to die and gonna be buried with your people. 
Nobody would like that pep talk, but Moses is not serving himself, he's serving the Most High. So Moses spoke to the people saying, arm some of yourselves for war and let them go against the Midianites to take vengeance for the Lord on Midian. A thousand from each tribe on all the tribes of Israel you shall send to war. Now this is really interesting here because we're talking about two and a half million people. And he only chooses a thousand from each tribe. Twelve thousand men, that's it. To go against the war, to go to war against the children of Midian. I find it extremely prophetic that he chooses 1,000 from each tribe because we see this exact same number all the way through the scriptures, multiple times in war, and in the book of Revelation, which we'll end with. But he chooses 1,000 from each tribe, so you have 12,000 that are going to war. So they were recruited from the divisions of Israel, 1,000 from each tribe, 12,000 armed for war. Then Moses sent them to war. I'm in verse 6. 1,000 from each tribe. He sent them from the war with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. Now, before I go into what Yahweh highlighted to me in this section is where I'm going to camp out, is so powerful of giving us a formula for not only war, but for life and all engines. This right here is an engine. Verse 6 is the engine formula for life. And it doesn't matter what compartment. It can be a family. It can be a congregation. It can be national Israel. It can be all of the congregation world. It doesn't matter what it is. It is the formula. I'm going to break it down for you in a minute. But before I do, I want to ask the question, why did he pick on the Midianites? Because if you know your Bible and you've been following along in the Torah portions, there's two parties involved. There's the Moabites and the Midianites. And they co-labored, they co-conspirated against the Israelites, okay? So why does God pick on the Midianites and not on the Moabites so much? Well, I'm going to submit to you the answer is found if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 26, verse 17. You see, the issue was really between the Moabites and the Israelites, but the Midianites decided to get involved in the middle of this. So the Midianites decided, you know what? There's a, war, there's a quarrel between Israel and the Moabites, but I'm going to get in the middle of this, and I'm going to have a grudge against Israel, and I'm going to join the Moabites. And here's what happened. In verse 17 of Proverbs, this is where we get a principle. It says, He that passes by and meddles with strife not belonging to him is like one that takes a dog by the ears. Now, how many have ever done that? Most of you have probably done that. It's just been, you know, a long, long time because every one of my kids have done that. I remember one time uh, we had a dog and uh, one of my little ones just walked into the living room. It was a small dog, a little Shih Tzu, and uh, was holding the dog by the tail, just walking through the living room like it was no big deal. It was a new toy. And uh, this dog was just, I think, in utter shock and didn't know what to do. But as soon as he it, it, it put it down, that dog, whew, gone, right? Well, if you would take a dog by the ears, that dog is going to turn around and bite you. And the scripture, this scripture is saying that when you get in the middle of someone else's issues, you're going to get bit. And when you get in the middle of something, a quarrel that's not yours... Bad things are going to happen. Here's why. Because there's one exception. You can get involved in someone else's issues if your heartbeat is to bring restoration in between those two people. But if you are joining a war that's not yours, let's, let's say, for example, that, that your friend is hurt by something that another friend did. If you take on the anger and emotion of your friend that got hurt, even though the other friend didn't do anything to you, you are finding yourself as a Midianite. You are taking a war and a grievance that's not yours, making it yours, joining sides, and in the process, making yourself the, an enemy. And there are so many people that have done this. Well, uh, even in my own life, I'm not going to talk to you because you have issues with this person. Have I ever done anything to you? No. Why, why, you, why, why do you, then why do we have issues? Because you have issues with them, or they have issues with you. Well, what does their issues with me have anything to do with my issues with you, or your issues with me? 
I don't have any issues with you. Then why are we talking about this? You see what I'm saying is that it causes multiple relationship problems because here's what happened. It never ends. So you got Johnny that's got an issue with Cindy, and Mike takes Johnny's side because he doesn't like the fact that Johnny got hurt. But now Mike and Johnny are together, but then Mike has a friend named George. And George says, well, I don't like the fact that Mike is upset, so I'm going to join Mike and John. And next thing you know, Mike's got a friend named Mark. And Mark's got a friend, now how can I remember all these names? But that's exactly how it works. You got Mark, John, George, and Mike, and everybody else involved. And everybody starts to take fire war instead of letting God take care of those things one at a time. So small principle before I go into the meat of the subject here tonight is this. Stay out. Don't put someone else's burdens on you. It is unbiblical to the nth degree. If one of your friends in your circle hurts someone else, your job is to bring mediation. You take sides if they haven't sinned against you and you have crossed the scriptures and fallen into the crosshairs of the Most High God. Don't do that. It's easy to do. Don't get me wrong. Because we all love our friends. But we can't do that. All right, here we go. Verse 7, or verse 6. Then Moses sent them to war, 1,000 from each tribe. He sent them to war with Phinehas. Why does he send them to war with Phinehas? There's a prophetic connection and a formula here. First time Phinehas ever gets involved with war at all. He gets chosen, hand-picked. Because he, is, he was chosen because he already proved his heart intent. His heart intent was to stop the plague from spreading. And he hated sin so much. Remember, because what did, what did, Baal, excuse me, what did uh, the Moabites and the Midianites do? What did King Balak do eventually? Balaam gave him the advice. Hey, just uh, dress up your most beautiful women and send them over to Israel. If I can't curse them, God says I can't curse them. I can only say what God tells me to do when I'm in prophecy mode. But since I'm not in prophecy any mode, here's the strategy. Dress up the, the Moabite and the Midianite women and send them over there because there's a law that God gave the Israelites that they're not allowed to, to, uh, to follow or to take wives uh, from you guys. And if they do that, they'll bring a curse on themselves and I won't have to curse them at all. And that's exactly what happened. The plan absolutely worked. And now God's so upset, Phineas got, gets upset because there's 24,000 people that died in this, in this uh, plague that God sent over this issue. So he sends them to war and Phineas gets to lead them. So there's a, there's a characteristic that's involved here that shows you something that God really likes. Now I don't know about you, but I want to be someone that Yahweh likes. I want to be someone that's after his own heart, don't you? So when Yahweh begins to give us and elevate something to the, to the forefront, we better take notice of things that he likes, okay? Because it's a love relationship. Husbands or your wives, you need to pay attention of what she likes. It took me years to discover my wife's not really into red roses. It's not her deal. She loves wildflowers. She loves all the different color flowers. But for years and years, I'd buy red roses because that's what we're trained to do. And, you know, it's not that she, she, you know, was unappreciative, but when I brought her wildflowers, and God forbid if I stop and actually pick them myself out of the neighbor's yard, I get really big points. <laughs> but right here, Yahweh's beginning to tell us exactly what he likes. He likes zeal, because Phineas had tremendous zeal. He had absolutely no compromise and no taste for sin whatsoever. He would not allow it in his camp. He would not turn a blind eye to someone else's sin. It was not even his sin. Most of us in the situation with the Israelite that took the Moabite women, most of us would go, you know what? I remember Mount Sinai when 3,000 people died. I remember Korah when God opened up the earth and swallowed the 250 liters uh, of, of, of Korah and his family. I, you know, I'm just going to do the whole stand back and let God judge thing. Most of us would not get involved. But see, true leaders, when they see sin, they go right to the altar. Do you realize that's where the death took place? Right at the altar. Now here's the really interesting thing. The leaders of Israel are there. Don't think that Phineas just came in 
unannounced with no authority because it appears that he is walking in a maverick position, subverting authority and taking matters into his own hands. But you have to understand the tabernacle that there ain't no way he's getting through that eastern gate with a spear in his hand running 100 miles an hour. That's like somebody walking into a speech of the President of the United States with a machine gun and no one does anything. No, there was automatically something happening behind the scenes where there was an authority or a agreement with what Phineas was about to do. And he otherwise he could he he could be killed, which is part of why Phineas is put in, put in the position of the greatest authority of the army at this moment. Why? Because he took the position of Esther. He took the position of, I am willing to die because I know what I'm about to do is about to break the law because there's no court system that I'm going through. So I'm going to take my chances as I run through the sanctuary with this spear in my hand that if they, if they try to stop me and I kill, I will be held in contempt of court and I will be killed. But I'm willing to do that because I know that God is bringing this plague upon my brethren because of this. I'm willing to sacrifice my life and put my life on the line for the sake of my family and my brethren. That is what God got so impressed with, is he was literally willing, out of the heart of rebellion, to subvert the authority system and the, and the, and the bait din system, if you will, the house of judgment. He was willing to go around the entire system to stop the plague out of the love for his brethren. In the process, the priests and those in authority allowed it to happen. Maybe because they didn't know what else to do. Sin was right in front of them, and they were turning a blind eye. Phineas took care of it. So one of the most powerful characteristics that a man of God can have is he absolutely will not tolerate sin. And let me go further, he will not tolerate even the appearance of sin. Let me get personal with some of you out there. And I'm talking maybe not to you, but maybe to this entire Christian world out there whose daughters look exactly like the daughters of men. Husbands let their daughters dress like the daughters of the Midianites and the Moabites who are dragging away the godly men and whoring among them. If I lined up all of the Christian women and the young women at youth groups in most of the Christian churches today, and then lined up all of their friends from high school, you would never tell a difference. Because you'd see their shorts all the way up. And my, can I just be honest with you today? It's sick. We are sending our daughters out as what 50 years ago would be called a prostitute. And we wonder why the average age of women losing their virginity, girls, is 11. And we just say, oh, it's the culture. No, it's demonic is what it is. If you want your daughters to whore among the nations and get pregnant by the time they're 17, let them dress like the world because those boys out there are not trying to befriend them just to uh, go to a sports game with them. My daughter and one of her friends were driving just a week and a half ago, late at night to go to a, you know, a Shabbat. Uh, they were just getting together with some friends, and a guy was driving next to him, a teenager, and flashed his phone of his Google Maps as if he was lost, trying to get them to pull over. When I first heard that, I thought, wait a minute, if he has Google Maps, why is he lost? Okay, dead giveaway, we have a problem on our hands. And you and I both know that that young man's intentions were not to have a prayer meeting on the side of the road. There was ill intentions there. And some of those things are going to happen regardless, and we need to prepare our young people for that. But the reality is, is that we are not allowed biblically to mix the seed. And I am tired of losing our young people. The young people are being lost, and you know why? It's the parents. It's not the young people's fault. You know, some people say, Jim, you know, you homeschool all six of your girls, and, you know, don't they feel like, don't you feel like they're sheltered, and, and you know, so on and so forth. And I said, heck yeah! I'm sheltering them from this hurricane that's around us. The hail, the storm, and all of the junk that's out there. Praise God that my daughters don't know 
not even 1% of what I knew at their age. I'm sorry for getting fired up, but guys, we are right here in the land of Midian and Moabites and a war is raging and our children are the ones that are being slaughtered before the fires of Molech. And us parents just take a blind eye and say, well, you know, it's just, it's just the way it is and I can't really do anything. About it. You can do something about it, I can assure you, because the previous section says that if your daughter or your son lives in your home, you make the rules. Your daughter says, Dad, I'm wearing this low-cut shirt and this is the shorts because this is what everybody says. That is a vow she's making and according to the Torah, you have the right to say, sorry, honey, disannulling that vow. Get your backside back in here and put this tunic on. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying, though? My, my passion, I'm so passionate about that. I have six little girls and I do not want to lose them to the world. I will do anything and everything to make sure that they see Christ in me and they see a holiness standard. Let's just, let's just go off the record for a second. Ladies, we've got to get to the place where you understand what modesty is. Modesty is not dialing yourself up unless you are in the privacy of your own home for your husband's sake. We like that. Just being honest. I like it when my wife looks beautiful, and it doesn't take anything for her to do that. But the rest, I don't want to see your wife with cleavage. I'm sorry. You got a pastor that's blunt. That's, that, that's, that's your problem, but really, I believe that God is sick and tired of us showing off our bodies for other men to struggle. We're tired of it. We get enough of it at Walmart in the magazine rack and everything and every commercial that's on TV has got sex written all over it to pull our eyes from our wives. We don't need the people of God pulling other men in a direction that the world is pulling us. Be holy and be godly and help us for crying out loud. And you might say, well, I don't want to look weird. Be weird. God says holy is good. You're going to get a new robe on Judgment Day, and I can assure you it ain't going to have a slit all the way up to the waist. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> all right, so we better get back to the Scriptures. So the first uh, character that God really desires that he shows us and it rises to the top is he wants zeal and he wants a no compromise. Holiness comes from doing God rules. It doesn't matter what your emotions, your feelings, or what this culture says. We are supposed to look, act, feel, eat, think differently. We are aliens sojourning in this land that is not our home. Our inheritance is overseas with a kingdom that's coming down. You better look for it and prepare for it because at some point, I believe that God's got some angel on judgment day and it's simply this. Maybe it's not a book of all your works. Maybe it's just a picture of what you're supposed to look like and you come up and he puts it over the top of you, layers it over you and says, nope, doesn't look, act, think, drink, taste or feel exactly what I'm looking at. Excuse me, depart from me, I don't know you. Maybe we are supposed to look different. Maybe we're supposed to feel and act and think and speak differently. Go figure, we're not supposed to look like them. Why is it that we look like them, we talk like them, we, go, we see the same movies as them? On top of that, we keep the same traditions as them, we keep the same holy days as them. Something's wrong with America, ladies and gentlemen. We've lost our inheritance. We've lost our drive. We've lost our God. We've lost the instruction manual. We've watched, lost the scrolls. And in the process of losing everything, we've lost our souls. And we've lost our children. Someone's got to stand up and take the spear and say, I'll take the heat if God wants to bring it. But I'm putting down the sins of this generation. I'm striking the enemy through the heart. It's time to bring back the ancient times, the ancient scrolls, the ancient ways, the footsteps of God. And it starts with zeal, and it starts with no compromise. Say, no, say zeal. zeal. Say no compromise. no compromise. 
Say zeal. zeal. No compromise. We will be passionate. We will be passionate and not compromise. That's the first and second characteristics. The next one we come to, interestingly enough, is he's with the son of Eleazar. This is second in command of the high priesthood. So what does this tell us? This tells us that everybody that's sitting on this stage right here all across the globe that calls themselves pastor, bishop, priest, you name it, overseer, we better be at the forefront of that war. We better be found with the people. We better have our staff in one hand and a sword in the other. We better not be found in our offices and buried in the word of God while the people of God are are perishing in a war. We better be out in front because the thing that wins wars is the zeal of God, the no compromise of his people, and then you must have the holy of holies with you. You must have the anointed priest of God standing by your side supporting you in the war. They better be up front. Holiness is not in some... Is, is not in some back office somewhere. Holiness is out on the front of the war being willing to be killed for those that are everybody behind you. Husbands, you want, to get, you want your wife to get so excited she's on the edge of your seat? Be willing to give your life for her. Be willing to get out in front of the war. Go to war for her. Be zealous. Get the compromise out of your life. Get it out of your house. Do an audit of your home. Get the movies that are unholy out. Get everything out of your house. It's not holy. Make a change. Stand up to your wife and say, I'm sorry, wife, I love you, but I am the priest and head of my household, and this is what God has commissioned me to do, and it is my responsibility, and on judgment day, he's not going to turn to you and say, why did you let the... He's going to turn to me. Joshua didn't say, as for my wife's house, we will serve the Lord. He said, it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord regardless of what my wife says, my daughter says, my children says, or my goldfish says. <laughs> Husbands, take your rightful authority, and I mean not to wield that sword in a way that's unholy, but in love you surround, you protect. This is making sense. Next we get from the son of Eliars or the priest with the holy articles. Do you understand what God is saying here? In the war, they always brought the Ark of the Covenant. Why? There is something off the charts powerful about this that's hidden in, the, in this message, in this word of holy articles. Who is the only man in the Bible that God says is a man after my own heart? David. Do you know why? We're going to find out right, right now. We're going to take a little rabbi trail. Can we do that? Turn to Psalms 119. I'm fired up. We could be here till morning. Psalms 119, one of the most powerful chapters in all the Bible that everybody knows about. It's made up of 176 verses, and so I'm just going to ask you, Natalia, pick a number between 1 and 176. 64, she chooses 64. Verse 64 says this, The earth, O Yahweh, is full of your mercies. Teach me your statutes. Pick a number, Michael. 112, he says. 112, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Pick another number. 21, making me go back multiple pages. Here we go. Verse 21 says this, you rebuke the proud, the cursed who stray from your commandments. Give me another number. 24, 24 says your testimonies alter my delight and my counselors. Give me another one. 36, 36 says this, it says, Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Give me another one. 165. 165 says this. Great peace have those who love your Torah and nothing causes them to stumble. And, and one more just for fun. 70. 70 says this. Psalms 119 verse 70. We could go on all night long with this. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your Torah. Ladies and gentlemen, the only reason why God calls David a man after his own heart is not because he's king of Israel, not because he shucked, skulls, shucked stalls in Bethlehem and was the eighth, son of the, the eighth bastard son, son that got called into service. It's because he loves God's commandments. He delights in them day and night. 
It is, a, it is a man after his own heart because what I'm about to tell you is some of you already know if you've gone through Shalom in the home, you're about to see what the heart of God is. If you want the heart of God and you better, and, and there's only one man in scripture that has it, you better start looking at King David and go, well, what, would, what was his character? What did he like? Because whatever he liked, God must have liked because God said he was a man after his own heart. But wait a minute, he committed adultery and murder. That's called a man after God's own heart, not because of the adultery and the murder, because of the repentance to Shuva and the focus for the rest of his life. So if you haven't committed adultery and murder on top of that, you're probably doing okay. If you take what he did for the rest of your life. Because in Hebrew, when you look at the Ark of the Covenant, when it tells them to build the Ark of the Covenant, it says take the sides of the Ark of the Covenant and make it this amount of cubits. That word sides there in Hebrew is the exact same word that God uses when he takes a rib out of the rib cage of Adam. That word sides is rib. And so what is God saying? It is the rib cage of God. The rib cage of God is, protects the heart of God. What's inside the Ark of the Covenant of why they have to bring it with them. It is the, to, the commandments of God is in there. The manna in the jar. And what? The rod of Aaron that budded. Which is directly from the tree of life in the garden thousands of years earlier. Some of you don't know that. That is what, why it's so powerful. He's carrying with him eternal life, power and eternal life and a staff of authority, bread that only comes from heaven, and the commandments of God, all encased in what's in the heart of God. And the interesting thing enough is that not only is it the heart of God that's going before them in war, it is the, it is the high priest that's standing right there. And the same heart of God is actually the seat of God. Because what's on top of that? Nothing other than the mercy seat. It is a throne, ladies and gentlemen. Why do you think in India today, or in different eastern countries, when they're carrying the king, they carry them on poles and sitting on their throne through the streets? Where do you think they got that idea? Some stroke of genius? No. They got it right out of the Hebrew Scriptures because they are carrying the throne of God on their shoulders, ladies and gentlemen. They are carrying the power and the authority and the heart of God into battle with them. So what does this tell us in another formula? First, we have the zeal of God. Then you have the non-compromising ability of God. Then you better join yourself with the holy people of God. And after that, you better make sure that you have the heart of God. Because inside the heart of God is found three components that are critical to your life. And if you miss out on one of those components, you will lose the war. In the components are you must have the standard of God. That is the commandments of God. The very commandments that David loved are the very commandments that somehow today we have said are done away with in our bondage. Are we kidding ourselves? We're telling King David that what you delight in is bondage? What does it matter with us? We're sounding like the serpent in the garden that slithered his way up the tree and right into the ear of Eve and said, what God said is bondage. He didn't really mean it. He knows that if you eat it, you'll die. Or you'll be, you'll be full of, of wisdom. And he doesn't want you to have that. So just, just, just he's not, you're not really going to die. It's a lie from the pit of hell. The very first thing that God wants inside of his heart is to understand the fence, the instructions of God. Because the fence of God is in your house, your walls. You want to live your life? How many want to you just go out in, in, in you know, downtown St. Louis or downtown Detroit Okay, because we're the top two out there. And just say, you know what? I'm just going to sleep in a tent. I don't want to go inside my house and sleep tonight. I'm going to sleep in a tent. Matter of fact, I'm so comfortable out here in this beautiful night air. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to sleep outside on the street. How many of you would even sleep on your front porch? Much less downtown of any city in America. You wouldn't do it for almost anything probably. We were talking about this the other day on how 20 years ago, 25 years ago when I was a kid, my mom, I would leave in the morning in summertime and I'd only come back because I know dinner's on, on the table. How many of you out there, man? I mean, your parents had no clue where you were at. 
I was five counties over. I would call my mom. She'd, where are you at? Oh, I'm at my friend's house. Where is he? Uh, Kansas. Wow. Make sure you're home by dinner. There was no concern. Today, I will not allow my children to play in my front yard, and I live in a nice neighborhood. We live in different times and different places. The fence of God is for our protection. Go figure, the enemy has turned it around that it's not. What he wants to do is, see, what God wants to do is want you to look from the inside of the house to say, these walls are for protection from the inside. And the enemy says, he changes your perspective and says, no, you're not on the inside. God doesn't love you. You're on the outside. And by the way, if you look at that, it's, he's trying to keep you from going inside the house. He just changes the perspective. And I'm here to tell you that if you love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, you are inside the house, and those walls are there to protect you. Don't tear them down. It's time to rebuild the walls. That's number one. Number two, it's not just the commandments of God. The commandments of God alone will not protect you. Excuse me, let me say it differently, because the Lord is correcting me. Sorry about that. The commandments of God are designed to protect you but they're not designed to feed you. It is the jar of manna that is designed to feed you. And that is the bread of God that comes daily in your relationship and your walk with Him, that rhema word. Let me tell you what a rhema word is, okay? Today I had a prophetic word and I'm so upset with myself that I did not listen to the voice of God because as I got dressed uh, this afternoon, there was a, a piece of jewelry on my nightstand that uh, we found, and I don't know if it's real or not. So the Holy Spirit tells me, as clear as day, pick the piece up and take it with you so that you can show it to your friend Mike George. And I literally went for it, and then I didn't, and I thought, well, he's never been to PFT, and he doesn't go to our, our, our fellowship. Why? He's not even going to be here. He's here tonight for the very first time. And I had no idea. And I walk in the door, and my friend Jim Raleigh says, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, Mike George is here. And I went, what? Are you kidding me? And Jim's like, I'm sorry. What did I say? You know. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. God told me to bring this so that he, I could show it to him, and he could tell me, you know, give me a value or appraisal for it. And I literally told God he's not going to be here. And I could just see God going, geez, who's God here? I don't understand. I mean, who's on the throne? You know, you argue with me, and you missed a huge blessing, because how cool would it have been for me to pull it out and say, oh yeah, God said you were going to be here. Can you tell me if this is, what this is? Would have freaked him out, right? But it was neat enough that God would share that with me. That's the manna. That's the manna of God. That daily walk with him, where you hear his voice, and you walk in his ways. But it's not just enough to be protected and have the food of God. There's one other thing that you need. You need the staff of authority from God himself. You need the, the staff that blossoms. See, it's too, it's too much that we have. It's too many people that are using the staff and beating people with the staff of God. Hey, you're going to keep the word of God. Ugh. Break the word of God. I'll show you how to keep God's word. Get over here. That's what we do. You know, it says the rocks will cry out because most of us are beating the rocks like Moses, right? And the rocks are crying out. We are not supposed to beat people. We're not supposed to beat God's people over the head or the enemy or the, those that are, don't know him with the word of God. Do you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to take the rod of Aaron and just hold it long enough knowing that the authority of Yeshua the Messiah is inside of you and you're supposed to bear fruit because those who truly have the authority of God it's obvious because people are eating from the fruit that is falling at their feet. You see, the, it's, very, it's very incredible. God gives a, a missionary statement long before you get to the Gospels where it says, go into the Samaria and the other parts of the earth. He tells Israel, he says, I want you to grow strong in your root. I want you to keep my commandments and my statutes. Believe me that I'm God, that I've got things figured out, and I see the parade from the beginning, middle, end before you do. And when your tree grows, the boughs of Joseph will be so big and so strong, they'll go over the walls. 
And the fruit will drop on the other side. And the nations who are in darkness will naturally come towards the light because you're a city on the hill. And at the base of your wall, they're going to find fruit. And that fruit that comes from the tree of life of the seed of the Messiah inside of you will have seeds inside of it. And when they eat eat from that tree, it will literally begin to reproduce himself. And they will say this, and I'm quoting, What God do you serve that gives such amazing statutes, commandments, and decrees that would cause your rod to blossom in fruit to a place where it satisfies even us? How wonderful would it be if missions today would simply be us standing and producing fruit, and they come and say, man, like some one, one woman came to me months ago, and she said, you know, I, this is my third time here, and like I'm, I'm totally getting that you got some strange beliefs, and I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure if I even agree, but I cannot deny the Holy Spirit in this place. You know what she's doing? She's drinking from the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit on the inside, what the Scriptures and Psalms call the deep, it cries to deep. And you cannot deny the power of God when you experience it. So today, ladies and gentlemen, when you are in your war, when you are moving forward in all the issues of your life, Write it down and don't make this a message that you just forget. Write it down and put it on your mirror that you need the passion and zeal of God. You need to not compromise and audit your life and find out where you're out of alignment. Someone asked me yesterday about alignment. I said, this is the way I look at it. Why God is so important that, that His appointed days, the Holy Moedim, the, 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 the feast days of God. Why, why does God choose one day over another? Because he's God. And he can do that. And where do you think we got the whole idea from? How many of you have anniversaries and birthdays? Why don't you tell your wife, honey, we're going to not celebrate our anniversary this year on July 5th. We're going to do it in April. We're going to do it on April 15th. Oh, of all times to celebrate any birthday or anniversary, right? Tax day. But you know what? What if you just didn't even call? on your anniversary and you're out of town. Now think of the logic. It's illogical. Your husband loves you. He, he, he totally bears his soul to you, protects you. He's a godly husband, but he forgets to call because he's in a business meeting all day long and your feelings are hurt. It's, is it, well, oh, come on, let me just use our theology. Is it every day alike? Why does it matter? It matters because there was something special that happened on that day that you want to remember. The birth of your children, you'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. I remember every single one of them. That day is special. Well, God created the universe. And in six days, He created the heaven and the earth, and He rested on the seventh day. And when these feast days and these Moedim come about, and the Shabbat comes around, He remembers, ladies and gentlemen, that that was the day that He rested, and He said, It is finished, and it is good. And 4,000 years from that day, the Messiah Himself would be dying on a cross, and He would look up to the heavens, and He would say, Tetelestai, it is finished. And then three days later, on the morning of the first day of the week, he rises from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, we should not forget the holy appointments that he makes. And where am I going with all that? Is there is a, ver there is a horizontal window. It's kind of like an ocean in the heavens. And there is a portal that he opens up. You can believe me or not believe me. It's just the Bible. But he opens up a drain on Shabbat and on his days. And when that drain opens up, if you're over here, the water comes over here, you may have some splash because maybe you're a day off. But God says, I want to shower you in my mercies. I want to shower you. This is the portal. This is the alignment that I said. You can say all day long that I didn't mean what I said, but I meant what I said. So much so, I took the southern kingdom of Israel and put them in bondage for 70 years in Babylon because they forgot my Shemitah years and my Sabbaths. Ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't sound like a God that says, eh, they're just no big deal. 
It is a big deal. God cares. You know why? Because it's his anniversary. It's his anniversary every week. It's his anniversary every year. It's not legalistic. It's legal. We get to do it. It's freedom. Amen? All right. Last but not least, where was I? So you have the zeal of God, the non-compromising characteristic of God. And then you have a priest of God, which means you've got to have community as much as and best as you can. Men, wake up and be the head of your household in the holy priesthood. But after that, you have to have and understand the Torah, the commandments of God are protection. But it's not just that only. You better have the Spirit of God and the rhema word. And last but not least, you need to bear fruit. And it's in that order. You, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 that those who love the children of God keep his commandments and they're not burdensome and when you keep his commandments it changes your character because like Paul says in Romans 7 he says that I thought that I was alive until I read the word and I realized that I'm not supposed to do this and it killed me and when it kills you you raise from the dead the word of God is supposed to kill you it's designed to look for flesh go figure that's what it's designed to do it was added for what transgressions It's supposed to point out your transgressions. It's supposed to point out your carnality. Romans chapter 8 says that those who walk in the Spirit subject themselves to the law of God. Those who walk in their carnal flesh are at enmity against God and cannot submit to His laws. Read it for yourself. So when you walk in the commandments, what you're doing is you're saying, God, you make the rules, I don't. I decide to say in your house, whether I like it or not, I don't understand it, don't get it, I really like to do this, but I'm going to do what you want because i just going to realize you're the one who makes the rules. When you do that, there's a protection. Now you get to sit at his table and eat the manna. Nobody ate the manna in the wilderness, ladies and gentlemen, that did not follow the kingdom principles of his Torah. Because on Friday, he said, pick up twice as much. I'm going to bless you all the way through the weekend. Those of you that that broke the Torah and only picked up a single amount, they went back out on Shabbat, nothing there. They starve. Nobody gets the manna, the true manna of God, and that true deep and intimate intimacy. Because let me just say this, like I've said a million times, I'm sorry that I'm on a roll, but this is what God is saying. He says this again, the greatest curses sometimes are the blessings you don't even know you're missing. Sometimes the destiny that you had, we talked, we started, and I'll end with the same thing. 19 years old, 17 years old, 12 years old, God called you into ministry, God called you this, God called you that, whatever. You had a destiny, you had a purpose, and the enemy stole it from you. Why? You never hit your destiny because you were not inside the formula of God. You were at a war, and you didn't have the proper principles. Either the zeal wasn't there, or the holiness wasn't there, or there wasn't spiritual accountability, or the commandments weren't there, or the rhema word, or you didn't bear fruit. But that is the formula of God, and if you bring that out to war, ladies and gentlemen, you wipe out every single person and it's the only war in all of Israel that not a single soldier was lost. Not one. Every male was wiped out on the other side. Not a single sword was bloodied. Praise our King that when we follow His instructions with the love and the Spirit of the Most High God feeding us every day, we will bear fruit And the nations will bow before our God, and we will never even have to convince them. And by the way, if we want to know why our kids have walked away, it's because we've not kept the war principles, or we didn't know them. So our kids look at us, and they don't see a priest. They see compromise. They might even know it. They may even fight it because they want the compromise because the flesh is inside of them. At the end of the day, when we pull these principles together and we use the character of the Most High God in the war that we, were, we are in, we will not only win this war, we will take back the land and the inheritance that is ours. I know it's almost, I know it feels like we're losing and it's over with. You're going to see things on the news in the next com- in coming week or so that is going to blow your mind. Some things that are coming down on a global, there's a global shift right now. There's something that's going to happen. You're going to see it on the news. Conspiracy theory is going to go crazy. There's a shift that's happening. 
You can believe me or think that I'm just being rhetorical, but I'm telling you, before you right now, there is a massive war that is just beginning, and he's galvanizing both sides. If you think the war in Israel right now is just happenstance, it's not. It's the first time they've gone into Gaza, and they're going down into the tunnels to rout out the enemy from where they are, to pull the weapons cache and to pull their finances out from the root. It is a prophetic symbol of what God is about to do and what he's doing. He is galvanizing his forces, his people worldwide, because he is sick and tired of being on the defense and watching his bride harlot herself. He is going to go into and he is going to take over the enemy's camp and then he's going to go down into the tunnels and he's going to go into the black places where nobody wants to go and he's going to route out the weapons caches and he's going to transfer that kingdom wealth like he promises years and years and years ago, thousands of years ago in prophecy. He's about to transfer the authority, that ring, if you will, that was taken in the garden. He's going to give it back to us because, ladies and gentlemen, we were the ones that God trusted to rule this world. We're the ones that gave that authority back over to the enemy. And I know, and I'll leave leave you with this, God is looking for a few men like Phineas that are being okay with being called Pincus. He's looking for a few good men that that understand the Scriptures, that have the spirit and the zeal and the power of the living God walking through them, and they will just walk until they produce enough fruit for the nations. It's happening, it's beginning this weekend, and it's going to continue You're going to see open doors. I'm prophesying. I'm telling you, you're going to see open doors of restoration, open doors of healing, open doors of recalibration and reset, doors that were barred and concreted. You're going to see concrete fall and flake, and you're going to see a door there that you haven't seen in 25 years that someone may be shut in your face, are going to open up miraculously. You're going to meet someone at the supermarket that you haven't seen in 30 years that hurts your feelings 30 years ago, and there's going to be instant restoration. God is doing something right now with His people, and it's called this, judgment. Judgment has started. That very scripture that we have been talking about for years, it starts with who? The household of God. And you know what? I hate to tell you this, but the household of God is very definitive in its description of who's part of that. You better have that formula because that's the, that is the description of the household of God. Because the household of God is literally defined as the temple of God. And if you're the temple of the Most High, what's supposed to be in it? The Ark of the Covenant, which contains what? The commandments, the manna, and the, and the budded blossom of the rod of Aaron. Stand with me tonight. This is a heavy message, I know. It's like a William Wallace message, okay? But it's time to take back what is rightfully ours. It's time to take back the things that have been stolen from us. Our children are depending on us to not mess this next generation up. We've already messed up that Y generation and half of X. And we wonder why they're playing video games because that's what we do. We don't want relationship with them. We just give them an iPad. We don't want to talk to them or play games with them. We just shove an iPhone in their face. Give them a video game. Give them the next thing what they want. I'm telling you what they want and what they need are two different things. What they need is relationship. What they need is holiness. What they need is godly principles. What they need is a standard to be proud of. I want people 30 years from now, if I'm dead and gone, I want them to look back and they see that there's a generation of holy women that came out of this place that were once little girls and they are so pure and so holy that they they can choose from a godly, a thousand godly men and none of them would be good enough. And then warriors of a Joshua generation that would be raised up that they would not be embarrassed to say, I love the Lord God. And this is what I do. Why do you do that? When people say, well, how come you guys don't keep Christmas and Easter? Why isn't it our first thought to say, how come you do? I'm not trying to be funny. Why do we have to be on the defense? At least I can find my holy days in the Bible. (laughs) 
And I'm not talking about pulling a sword out of meanness, ladies and gentlemen. You get what I'm saying. With all love and with all shalom. It's time that we pull the Nehemiah challenge back out of our back pockets and we start doing Bible things in Bible ways on the level of our knees. And when our children wake up at 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning, sometimes they do, and they see their mom and their dad praying, you're speaking volumes. But then you better take what you, what you read and you better put it into practice. Because our God reigns and He's alive today and He died, ladies and gentlemen. The Messiah died not so that we could bring sin and Midianite women back into our camp. He died so that we could be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. So as we close with this song, I want you to understand the depth of when we say hallelujah, which simply is a word that means this, praise hallel, yah. It's praise yah. And do you know when in scripture they praised yah? When they won the war. So I declare before my king tonight, unlike any other nights, oh God, Tonight is different. You said in the beginning it was going to be different. I had no idea what you were going to say, oh God, and I am humbled that you decided to show up, oh God, and grace us with your word and your presence. But Father, it's different than any other night. This is not a night to come before your courtroom, oh God. You have left the courtroom. You are out on the battlefield today, and you are asking for your armory to show up, your people to put beside their, their, their theological conundrums of not understanding oh, everything. Lord, you're not asking us to understand everything. You're asking us to trust you and obey you. And as we do that, you will teach us your heart. Father, the battle has begun. You've shown me that. I know that. But God, I pray. I thought the, I was in already a battle. I wasn't, God. I was only in boot camp. Lord, what an honor it is to be in a war with you at our side. But Lord, like Moses said, if you take the staff away from us, we will surely die. It is the very tree of life, oh God. We pray that you would teach us your commandments, your word, your decrees, and, and, and help us understand them. But, but Father, beyond that, feed us with the words from heaven that go deep inside the soul. They separate marrow, bone, and joint. They go inside the heart valves, God, and they break open valves that are, are broken right now. They heal. They forgive. They stand up for what's right. They don't care about left or right. They only have their eyes on the road in front of them. So, Father Yahweh, I pray you to heal the nations today and start it with the families of your local assemblies. Get husbands fired up, oh God. It doesn't matter if they can quote a single scripture. Father, I, I pray that you give them the strength and the zeal of Phineas to not compromise anymore. Let that be the only thing that they know that begins the power working inside of them is that they don't know, but they're not going to compromise. And Father, I pray that you would surround us with your glory. Help us to be in alignment with the windows of heaven. God, I want to be under the drain of, you, of the showers of your love. But not just your love only, God. I don't want to be on the beach. Father, I, I know that there's a war. And the promised land has to be taken. It's not given. Help us to rout out the giants that have stolen our inheritance the giants of media, the giants of finance, the giants of education. Every mountain God has been hijacked and they're sacrificing to the Baal of Peora and the Asherah poles in the high places. I declare tonight that that transfer starts God with our people, your people humbling themselves and praying and turning from our wicked ways. Father, will you heal our land? Will you hear our voices? Who am I, God? But send me. Here I am. Everybody say, here I am. Send me. Lord, we may be small, 
but our hearts are big and we have a zeal to reach your people wherever they may be found in every tribe and every tongue. We need all the help that we can get. Send the generals, the captains, the soldiers, the nurses. Father, send everything that we need to accomplish what you put in our hearts this day. And everybody said, amen. I truly wish um, for everybody to have their eyes open and just see the angels that are in this place. Um, whenever the worship team was doing the last song that they did, um, I saw angels praising here. It was just so beautiful to see heaven here praising with us. And I also hear right now, I don't know if this is a time of prayer or who needs prayer, I don't know, but the Father says it is a time of asking. He hears you. He's here to hear your voice. Whatever you want to ask, He says ask. Um, and I also hear um, right now there is somebody, I, I don't know if, if that person is here or maybe online, but I have so heavy on my heart. There is somebody that um, thinks this person thinks has no worth. It's not worthy at all. This person thinks that is alone. Nobody cares. Nobody loves. Nobody's there. And the Father says, I love you. I am there. And you are so precious. I gave it all. I gave it all for you. You are so precious. Just thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your angels, Lord. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for receiving our prayers, Father. Thank you for giving it all for us. Thank you for paying such a price for us, Lord. Just praise you and glorify your name. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy.
yes to the Lord when I, I felt like in my spirit that I needed to go back and grab a flag and I asked the Lord, which one do you want me to give? And I really felt inclined to pick up the white one. And then I took it and the Holy Spirit said, no, I want you to go back and I want you to get the one that's for all nations. I said, well, Lord, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But then I learned from earlier today about the whole ring thing. And I decided to listen to him. And now I understand because the white flag is the flag of victory. But the first word, the Hebrew word that you see on that flag is kadosh. Victory is only found when, when you are set apart. Victory is only found when you're holy, as he is holy. So, so Lord, well, why would you have me, why would you just bring that one out first? He said, because victory comes last. The first thing you have to do is you have to be a light to the nations. The first thing you have to do is, is you have to sing to the nations the song of your life. When you sing to the nations the song of your life, it automatically, by default, produces holiness. See, holiness is not something that you attain. Holiness is something that you are. Holiness is something that is in, already inside of you that's waiting to come out. Holiness is just there like a seed planted inside of you just waiting for you to learn and walk in the formula of war. This happens automatically. Because interestingly enough, white is also the color of surrender. So when you surrender, you automatically win. Amen. All right, so Father, we just thank you so much for this night. We thank you for how good and how holy you are. We thank you, Father, that in the middle of fighting, God, all we have to do is surrender. All we have to do is say, God, I've had enough, I quit. I'm gonna do it your way. I'm gonna try it your way. And when you do that, Lord, you raise a banner. Your banner over us is love and it's victory all at the same time. When we surrender is when you set us apart. When you set us apart, we are automatically your people that you protect and your art goes before us and the war is already won. So Lord, I pray for everybody in battles right now, Lord, they'll surrender. They'll not lose hope, not lose faith. God, people that are in the very beginning of their journey, I pray you blow their mind. Lord, I pray the people in the middle of their journey, Lord, I pray you blow their mind. God, I pray that you would just continually blow through our minds. Awaken us to the slumber that we have been in with the cocaine of this world. Yahweh, we love you. We say tonight that you are holy. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy, God, for a three-hour service. You are worthy for a four. Lord, I love you. And I just want to say thank you. That no matter what this earth says, no matter what the governments of this world do, that we can trust you. That your heart is with us. Your ark is with us. And it's an ark of love. I pray that you would bless your people tonight. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May his countenance be lifted up over you. And at the end of your day, may he give you the peace that passes all understanding, the shalom that finds itself into every crevice of your heart. And may he bring restoration and rebirth into your life. Amen. Amen. Sing that chorus one more time. I knew you had it. You got a word, brother? You got a word? Okay. We're going to sing the chorus right after his, his word. My heart is burning right now. As I was over in worship, the Father, <laughs> I felt him just pouring on his place. And I said, I said, Father, what are you doing? And in the vision that he gave me, I saw a heart. And I saw the heart. Every time they said hallelujah, the heart peeled. And a piece of the heart fell off. 
and then another piece fell off. The more they said hallelujah, another piece fell off, another piece fell off, and I saw the top open, and it was like a rushing river coming downstream, and it just, it was actually angels. And down the line, you saw Yeshua on the throne, and he was entering into the hearts of his people. And as he entered in, he sealed the top and burst out light. There, were, there was a great burst of light that came out. We built walls around our hearts. That's right. That's right. The walls and the peels are simply just the callousness that the world has put on us. No, the religion of men. So may we sing hallelujah to our God. You are free and you're dismissed and you don't have to stay. Bless just, uh, bless God one last time. said this in a while, but you are now free Come on. to move about the country. If you were blessed by this teaching, please consider helping us reach the nations by making a donation today. Thank you, and God bless.